Okay, well, we'll make a start. Uh, a good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Pediatric Teaching for today. As I said, I wanted to talk about um, acute renal failure or, or what's now called acute kidney injury in children because it's, um, it's remarkably common for children who come into hospital to have some degree of kidney injury or kidney impairment um, uh, during their illness or during hospitalisation. And we'll talk about how common it is We'll talk about what, how to make an assessment of a child who's got an acute kidney injury, how to, how to diagnose acute kidney injury, and how to manage it. And so, I want to... uh, please, um, please mute your devices as we as we are talking, eh, so everyone can hear. So that's what we're going to cover today. As I said, acute kidney injury was often previously called acute renal failure. And we mostly notice, know, know it as acute renal failure, but these days it's called acute kidney injury or AKI. And I think that's a useful term because it, it covers from moderate changes in kidney function to anuric renal failure. And maybe in the past, we just focused on anuric renal failure. But in fact, there are many children, a much higher proportion of children that actually get a moderate um, degree of kidney impairment during their their illness. It's a little bit like hypoxemia is to acute respiratory failure. A child can be hypoxemic, but not in respiratory failure. And so it encompasses an earlier stage of deteriorating function of an organ, which in this case is the kidney. And I think it, it's useful because it helps us identify children in the early stages of acute kidney injury before they become uh, uh, severe injuries or um, or have acute renal failure. There's various definitions of acute kidney injury these days, and the two that you, you may know about, uh, one's called the RIFLE definition. It's not a very good acronym, but a RIFLE definition. And, and RIFLE stands for risk, injury, failure, loss, and end-stage kidney disease. And what it's really saying is that children go through these stages of just having a risk of an injury or some mild degree of renal impairment to having a, an established injury to then being in kidney failure, maybe having kidney loss if they uh, if their kidneys don't start working again, and then, of course, in-stage renal disease. But we're just going to talk today about the earlier stages, the risk, injury, and failure aspects of it. So the rifle criteria is one internationally accepted cr criteria. The problem with the rifle criteria is that it requires the assessment of creatinine and clearance. And that's a harder, a, a rather hard um, thing to measure, creatinine and clearance. Whereas the, the other definition that I think is probably better is the kidney disease improving global outcomes definition. It's CADIGO. CADIGO is the, is the acronym. And that's based on changes in creatinine and changes in urine output. So the two of those things together can, uh, can define uh, kidney injury or kidney failure. This is the Hidaigo, um definition. And there's, there's a little bit more to it than that, but I've tried to simplify it for this table. A child who's at risk of a kidney injury, that is, has a mild, or mild degree of kidney injury, um, has somewhere between 50% and 99% rise in their creatinine, which means that if it, it went from, uh, what, 30 to 45, that would be a 50% rise. And if it went from 30 to 60, that would be a 99% or 100% rise in their, um, in their creatinine. And it's over a seven-day period. Now, of course, we don't, for many children who've had, who have an acute kidney injury, we don't want to wait until they have it established for seven days. So it's really any child who has a 50 to 99% rise in their creatinine at any stage over a number of days during the illness has by definition um, stage one acute kidney injury. The other criteria, as I said, are not just the creatinine change, but a urine output. And that's in some ways a bit more useful because we can look at the urine output over a period of 12 hours and we can see a child not passing enough urine. So as you know, the, the normal amount of urine to pass is somewhere above 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. It's usually about one mil per kilo per hour, but somewhere 
anything below 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for six to 12 hours is, is at least the child's in at risk of kidney failure. The second stage, stage two, is kidney, what, what's called injury, and that's a, it's a doubling of their creatinine. So if, if a child has a doubling of their serum creatinine in, at any time in a seven-day period, then they've got an acute kidney injury stage two, and again, their urine output, or if their urine output's less than 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for more than 12 hours. And then acute kidney failure is where you have a tripling of your creatinine. And that is, it's gone up 200% from the time from the baseline. That So going from 30 to 90 would be a 200% a, uh, um, a increase in, in um, serum creatinine. And that would denote kidney failure. Or if a child's got less than 0.3 mils per kilo per hour for, for more than four hours, or they're anuric more than 12 hours, it, it's... It's clearly often we use the urine output and sometimes we'll use the serum, the, the serum creatinine. But I think if you couple both of those things together, then usually that's um, a specific measure of acute kidney injury or risk or kidney failure. There, there's also in the Cadigo criteria um, a glomerular filtration rate criteria as well, but we won't we won't cover that because it's just somewhat harder to measure. Again, the GFR is harder to measure like creatinine clearance. If we just base it on the serum creatinine and the urine output, then I think that's a, that's a good starting point um, uh, for, for, um, for the definition of acute kidney injury. The, these criteria are not designed for newborn babies, partly because the serum creatinine reflects the mother's creatinine, the baby's creatinine reflects the mother's creatinine. It's not, it's not as uh, useful in, in uh, neonates. The, the problem with these criteria are that they're based on serial, at least two measurements of serum creatinine. So you have to have a baseline and then you have to have a, um, uh, a second uh, creatinine. But it can be based on a doubling of the normal creatinine. For example, if, if, the, if the, the, the child's creatinine is twice what is the upper limit of normal, then that child has a, a doubling of their creatinine. So they've got an acute kidney injury of some sort. Waiting for two creatinine measurements, of course, may delay detection. It's also not always easy to measure it over over a period of days. And the may and, and also the creatinine takes a while to rise after the kidney injury has occurred. So even if the kidney injury occurs in the first twenty four hours, it might be another twelve or twenty four hours before the before the creatinine rises to a to a new steady state. And so we don't want to be identifying acute kidney injury too late. And that's why you need to use both the creatinine rise and the, and the urine output. When, if, you're, if a child has malnutrition, then creatinine comes from muscle breakdown, doesn't it? It comes from muscle breakdown. And if, you, if a child's got very little muscle because they're wasted and malnourished, then often their creatinine level is very low. Now, of course, if that doubles, then it's still the child's in kidney failure. Even if the creatinine comes up into the normal range, it's doubled. But nonetheless, for children who've got malnutrition, identifying creatinine changes is much harder because they're typically their creatinine level is extremely low. Again, as I said, in neonates, serum creatinine reflects maternal creatinine. So, so it's not as useful in neonates, but uh, and it's not quite as useful on its own in malnourished children who have wasting, but you can still use the urine output and the creatinine. There are obvious challenges in measuring urine output, aren't there, in, in recording urine output accurately. But in a child who's at risk of acute kidney injury, we just have to try to measure all the child's urine output, either by asking weighing nappies or getting them to, to um, pass urine in a bottle and, and, and measuring the volume or weighing nap or, or uh, having a urinary catheter. Um, there are other, other influences on the urine output. And even in a child who's got moderately established renal failure, they may be able to pass some urine with diuretics. It doesn't mean that they haven't got an acute kidney injury. It just means that the diuretics were still able to push out some urine. Um, and the last thing about urine output is that some types of AKI are not oliduric. That is, the patient will keep passing urine despite having 
renal impairments, despite having a rising creatinine and rising urea, they'll stay, may still pass urine, which is a good thing, but it can also confound our, our definition, our classification of, of acute kidney injury. So just um, these are just some things about AKI that you need to know in terms of establishing a definition in an individual patient. How common is acute kidney injury? There's, in many countries, it's not been well de uh, defined, but if you look at all hospitalized children in, in Western countries, it's around about 5% of all hospitalized children will have some sort of, of acute kidney injury. Often that kidney injury will be related to nephrotoxic drugs, um, but other um, their underlying problem is also a key, a key part of it. If a child's this is that's hospitalized patients overall. If a child's admitted to an intensive care unit, then it's even more common. So maybe uh, six to eleven percent of all children have uh, acute kidney injury. In the US, it may be up to twenty five percent of all children have acute kidney injury, and it markedly increases length of stay in hospital and, and ICU mortality. That's that's mostly data from Western countries. There's been less data from tropical countries where the etiology, the causes of AKI are different and where the frequency is likely to be different. There have been though quite a number of studies of both adults and children from low income countries. And it suggests that about 20% of hospitalized patients, at least adults and children develop some degree of AKI, but more than half of those are just stage one. They're relatively mild changes in creatinine level, like a, a 50 to a 50% rise in creatinine and their urine output is a bit low for a period of time. So these, this is mild renal injury, but uh, obviously we are more worried about children who've got stage two or stage three kidney failure. The mortality in children who've got kidney injury depends very much on the stage and it depends very much on the underlying problem causing the kidney injury, but overall, the mortality from acute kidney injury is around about 11%, if, uh, but again, depends on the stage. If a child's got stage three um, acute kidney injury, then their mortality is very high, especially if they can't get dialysis. And even on dialysis, the mortality is said to be 31%, even if a child's on, on peritoneal dialysis, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later, pra about practical things that we can do. What's, it's important to have an understanding of the causes of acute kidney injury because they are different in different countries. And, and uh, the causes of acute kidney injury in, in Western countries where there are, there's, a, for example, children having cardiac surgery or having complex uh, um, uh, operations that might lead to complications like acute kidney injury. It's very different in, in tropical countries where the most common causes of acute kidney injury are uh, systemic infections with shock, such as bacterial infection, bacterial uh, bacteremia, or malaria. You, you can look at the, the, you can track acute kidney injury and malaria around the world, and they're very closely related. So countries that have high rates of malaria also have high rates of acute kidney, kidney injury. Also, those countries also have dengue and dengue can be, uh, they're, they're, uh, can, can be associated with acute kidney injury, of course. And then there's other forms of um, pre-renal kidney failure, such as dehydration and shock due to gastroenteritis. So the, the most common causes of acute kidney injury are infections. And then less common, but still, quite frequent in tropical countries is acute hepatitis, and particularly that associated with group A streptococcal infection. And uh, as, as we've said in these talks before, there's a resurgence of group A streptococcal infection around the world. And I would expect we'd see more acute post-streptococcal GN and we'd see more acute kidney injury. Then there are, just like in countries all over the world, there are children who get acute kidney injury from drugs from nephrotoxicity from aminoglycosides or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs from amphotericin or I'll, I'll go through the different drugs and their effects on kidneys in a little while. In, in, in Western countries, one of the most common causes of AKI is a condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is also seen 
in lower income or tropical countries, but uh, but not as commonly. Just just because diarrhea and dehydration and sepsis are more common causes. Hemolytic syndrome or HUS is a form of sepsis in that in that children usually have a background E. coli infection or a pneumococcal infection, and then they develop hemolysis and acute renal failure. We'll talk a bit about that uh, uh, shortly. And then there's poisoning where we've talked before about different drugs that may cause kidney poisoning, um, but also herbal, herbal remedies and other, um, uh, other, um, uh, uh, other toxins can lead to kidney failure. Then, then there are a number of different, th these are all the causes of uh, acute kidney injury that have been described in Pacific Island countries in children. There, then there, there's animal envenomation, which clearly uh, snakes and wasps and bees, but predominantly snakes, isn't it? The, the, uh, each of these snakes have caused acute kidney injury. So the small-eyed snake, the mulga snake, the Papuan taipan, and the Papuan black snake, they all can produce an acute kidney injury. And it's usually by rhabdomyolysis, by producing a toxin that leads to rhabdomyolysis, which is a breakdown of the muscles. And that leads to the release of myoglobin that blocks the tubules and causes inflammation of the kidneys. And, and uh, that can lead to uh, severe rhabdomyolysis. Usually these children who have snake bite and have kidney failure also present with shock and sometimes with coagulopathy but it's a relatively common cause of acute kidney injury in, in, some, in PNG in some countries. So these are the most important causes of acute kidney injury, and you need to know, need to have some idea of this, I think. You can think about acute, the pathophysiology or the causes in, in another way, and that is... If, oh, excuse me. Hi, Steve. Yeah, good. Look, I'm just giving a lecture at the moment. Can I just call you back? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no worries. All right. Oh, I'll, I'll call you in a minute. All right. Oh, in, a, in about an hour is okay? Okay, bye. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I was, I was just saying that you can um, uh, you can think about acute kidney injury in, in, uh, in another way, and that is what pre-renal causes of acute kidney injury, renal causes and post-renal causes. And uh, I think you're, these will be familiar to you and we've gone through the, the, the causes, but dehydration from gastroenteritis or cholera or septicemic shock or malaria or dengue typically produce a pre-renal cause of, of acute kidney injury, but also they can have direct effects on the kidneys. So malaria and particularly malaria can have direct effects on the kidneys in, in terms of causing uh, a um, microthrombosis of the kidney, um, a microangiopathy or a microthrombosis of the kidney. Then there's renal causes of acute kidney injury and typically glomerulonephritis, so post-streptococcal GN particularly, or hemolytic uremic syndrome or nephrotoxic drugs. And the rhabdomyolysis, as I said, does it causes obstruction or damage to the renal tubules and um, and, lead, and can lead to renal renal failure. So, and then there's post renal causes again that are rare causes of acute kidney injury, but usually in the setting if a child's got a congenital renal tract obstruction and then gets an infection on top of that, that would that might cause a, an acute kidney injury with a basis that's post renal. So, pre renal, renal, and post renal. Just if you think about it in those ways, it may help you, it, it can help you both understand the causes, remember the causes, and also understand the pathophysiology, and also have an idea about how the immediate things you need to do to manage the patient. If they've got pre-renal failure, then they need usually need volume resuscitation, whereas if they've got renal failure, then usually they don't need a lot of fluid. The clinical assessment of a child who um, has has a, a, a suspected acute kidney injury really is not it's similar to the clinical assessment of any child, and that is you look for emergency signs and signs of acute kidney fun or signs of impaired kidney function. So you're looking for signs of shock. You want to know what the child's blood pressure is, and it could be low, as in if they've got pre-renal failure, or it could be high if they've got established renal failure. 
and hypertension because of that. You want to know about the pulse rate and the regularity because there are some complications of acute kidney injury that lead to, to, lead to um, uh, arrhythmias. And we'll talk about that in a little while. You want to know um, the child's hydration state and check if they've got edema and record the extent of the child's edema. You want to check if they've got severe pallor. They might have hemolytic uremic syndrome. They might have anemia related to malaria, or they might have any, any other cause of anemia that is linked to, to kidney failure. You want to check their conscious state and know whether they're alert or lethargic or responding only to painful stimuli or, or not responding at all. You need to have a good measure of their urine output. And that can take some work. If you've got a child who's poorly conscious, then putting in a urinary catheter seems the right thing to do if they are unlikely to pass urine by themselves. Um, but measuring their urine output to know if they've got um, oliguria is very important. And then also have some measure of other outputs because that influences how much fluid we want to prescribe for a child. If they've got ongoing diarrhea and vomiting, then they may be, get further behind on their fluids and their pre-renal failure may not improve even if we give a standard maintenance fluid. Look also when you're assessing these patients to, for associated conditions. So um, for the other causes that are linked to, um, uh, to uh, uh, renal failure, such as, such as looking for scabies or skin sepsis or cellulitis that might be related to a group A streptococcal infection and might have led to glomerulonephritis, for example. You should examine them to see if they've got pleural or pericardial effusions. Remember that many children who've got edema will also have a pleural effusion or a pericardial effusion or ascites. So you need to be uh, assessing them appropriately for that. And then look for other signs of malaria or dengue, like splenomegaly or anemia, et cetera, or, or petechiae, a rash like with dengue. Um, so uh, all those things should be part of your assessment of a child who has suspected acute kidney injury. Um, if, if, a, if you are worried based on history and examination that the child might have an acute kidney injury, then you also need to take the history about what led up to the, the kidney, the, the, the child's presenting, whether they might have pre-renal or renal or post-renal uh, um, acute kidney injury and take a history of drugs because they might have been exposed to some other medications. There are certain investigations that you should do. So uh, creatinine, urea, sodium, potassium, th those things should be done daily if you can, electrolytes daily. Measure the albumin as well because they might have nephrotic syndrome. You want to do a full blood examination to check for their hemoglobin because they might have hemolytic uremic syndrome, they might have malaria and anemia, et cetera. And, and you also can look for hemolysis when you're doing that. And so again, to rule out hemolytic uremic syndrome, and look for signs of infection on the full blood count. A urinalysis can be useful, especially if you're thinking the child might have glomerulonephritis. You can ask the laboratory to look for the number of red cells and also whether they're glomerular red cells, which are we've talked about before, but they're quite distorted red cells where they've been pushed through damaged glomerulus, glomerular capillaries. Whereas if a child's got hematuria from lower tract infection or bleeding from the lower tract, from the ureters or the, or the bladder, then they will have normal shaped red cells. They're not damaged by the, by the damage from the, um, uh, the glomerular capillaries. And then we'll talk a bit about the, the role of a renal ultrasound, which has a few a few things you can learn from a renal ultrasound if you've got a child who's got a suspected acute kidney injury. It's always worth as part of a investigations or the early management to try a trial of frusamide as long as the child's not hypovolemic. If they're hypovolemic, then of course, don't give frusamide, just give more fluid. But if they're if they're euvolemic, if their fluid balance is not, if they're not dehydrated and they're not, then it's useful to give 
a trial of frismide, and I usually give at least two milligrams per kilogram, usually two, uh, two milligrams per kilogram if you've got a child who's anuric, not, not if you've got a child who's passing some urine, I'd much give a much lower dose, half a milligram to one milligram, but if they're anuric, you give one to two milligrams of per kilogram of frismide. Or even more effective, if, if a child only passes a small amount of urine to that, to that to one or two milligrams per kilogram of frizomide, then a frizomide infusion is can be better. And you can run a few frizomide infusion for four to eight to 12 hours. And that can that can aim to re-establish a, a, a urine output. It's useful if you can in a child who's got impaired renal function to um, make sure the child keeps passing urine because Part, not, not that you can avoid a child having renal failure. If they've got an inciting uh, injury to their kidneys there, they will go into renal failure. But you can stop them being oliguric because non-oliguric renal failure, which is that means the child keeps passing urine, even if their creatinine and urea are high, is much easier to manage than oliguric renal failure, especially their nutrition. Because if you've got a child who's got who's got oliguric renal failure or anuric renal failure, then you're very constrained in the amount of nutrition um, uh, feeds the child can have um, uh, be because they'll have a fluid restriction. Whereas if a child's still passing urine, then you can at least keep um, uh, uh, keep nourishing them adequately to, for, the, for the days or weeks that they have um, uh, their acute kidney injury. So uh, always worth trying a dose of frusamide, one to two milligrams per kilogram, or a frusamide infusion, but don't keep giving it because if you keep giving it, then frusamide itself is nephro, you know, can be nephrotoxic in in um, uh, high concentrations. So um, a small amount is okay uh, for a limited trial, but not to keep giving it. The the majority of the management of acute kidney injury is to achieve a normal fluid balance and. Like I said, if you've got, if the child has signs of dehydration or shock, then you give 20 mils per kilogram of Hartman's solution to try to try to restore their circulation and restore the child's renal blood flow and therefore restore urine output. But if they have edema or hypertension and they're not in shock, then again, give bruzamide one to two milligrams per kilogram intravenously. And if they're euvolemic, that is, the, their fluid balance is neither overdone or underdone. If their fluid balance is 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 in the normal range, then you need to give the their insensible losses. I mean, we talked about this before. Insensible losses are the losses that you can't sense, the losses that you can't easily see, and it's about one fifth of their maintenance fluids. So you know how to calculate maintenance fluids with the four two one rule or the hundred fifty twenty rule then insensible losses are about one-fifth of that. So typically for a child who's got renal failure, we would give one-fifth of their maintenance losses, uh, of their maintenance fluid, plus their urine output, plus any other losses. So if a child's still passing some urine, that's helpful because it means you can give more nutrition, not, not more water or more um, uh, crystalloid fluid like Hartman's, but more nutrition. And that can be useful in a child who is going to have an AKI for some weeks, which often after a, an injury to their kidneys, they'll have an AKI that goes for several weeks. Remember, enteral feeding is always better than intravenous fluids, and, and you should try to minimize the intravenous fluids and optimize the enteral feeding a child has. If a child's anuric, then it's important to avoid high sodium containing fluids. So normal saline is not a very good fluid at all. So for patients who've got acute renal failure, or acute kidney injury, because it just contains some, too much sodium, which their kidneys can't really manage. So um, uh, again, enteral nutrition is the best way to manage patients with um, uh, acute kidney injury. When, when children eventually start passing urine and their creatinine is falling, then you can liberalize their fluids. But while they're anuric or oliguric, you have to stick to one-fifth their maintenance, just their insensible losses, plus their urine output, plus any other losses. 
it's very important to look at the child. If you've got a child whose creatinine is rising and the urine output's falling, then you should look at all their drugs and see if there's any nephrotoxic drugs that you need to either reduce the dose of or that you should cease altogether. And there are some agents, if a child's got a rising creatinine and falling urine output, if they're likely to be evolving into an AKI, then you just should cease those nephrotoxic drugs. You, if, if In the event that a child's got uh, post-streptococcal acute glomerulonephritis, then using penicillin for streptococcal infections is very, very useful. Of course, managing them like they've got a post-strep gene is, is useful. There, there are, I said that you should cease or reduce all nephrotoxic drugs. And I think that, I think uh, when we think about nephrotoxic drugs, we have to have some way of remembering what, what medications are toxic to the kidneys. Now, some of these drugs are directly toxic to the kidneys, and some of them are just 100% or nearly 100% renally excreted. So if you've got poor renal function, then the, the levels of these drugs are going to rise because your kidney can't uh, excrete the, the, the drugs or the metabolites of the drugs. But there are some anti antibiotics, particularly that are directly nephrotoxic in high, high doses. And so aminoglycosides and vancomycin, particularly amphotericin, they're directly nephrotoxic if, if there's impaired kidney function or if the doses you've given are too high. And the problem is, as the child goes into worse kidney failure or gets their, their AKI is worse, then their creatinine clearance or the glomerular filtration rate will be less. Therefore, their metabolism of the drugs or their excretion of the drugs will be less. Therefore, the level will build up. Therefore, they have more damage to their kidneys. And so it's very important for the, at least for the first three drugs. If you see a child who's got a rising creatinine and a falling, falling urine output, then important to cease those nephrotoxic drugs. There are some other drugs, antibiotics that cause kidney impairment sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes. So even heftriaxone and the other, what we call the beta-lactam antibiotics can cause renal impairment. And so if you've got a child with kidney failure or an AKI, then rethink whether or not they need heftriaxone or whether they need other, other drugs. There's one ART, antiretroviral therapy drug that should never be given to patients who've got an acute or chronic kidney injury, tenofovir. Um, and so th these are the antibiotic, the, the, the drugs. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, uh, no, I better I'll respond now. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so and the, there are some other drugs that are also toxic directly to the kidneys, and they're particularly concerning if you've got pre-renal um, renal impairment. So if a child's got dehydration or shock and they receive non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, then the, the effect of that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs is to reduce renal blood flow because of the effect on prostaglandins. The prostaglandin inhibition reduces renal blood flow and that can cause uh, pre-renal injury. It can exacerbate particularly if a child's got dehydration. The same for ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, they can reduce renal blood flow as well. And Fruzamide and spironolactone have two effects. One, fruzamide can be toxic to the kidneys if you're using too high a doses. And the, and the other effect is, of course, that it reduces blood volume. If, you, um, if it's effective and it's causing uh, marked diuresis and there's hypovolemia, then that, they can cause renal injury by, by uh, um, reducing renal, renal blood flow and therefore reducing uh, renal function or glomerular filtration rate. 
if ever a child's having a, a CT scan with contrast, you need to be very careful that they don't have an acute kidney injury because it'll almost certainly get worse by giving intravenous contrast to patients um, who've got an AKI. And you can turn them from having stage one to stage three disease with, with um, iodine contrast. And then there's a few chemotherapeutic drugs that are particularly cause acute kidney injuries, cisplatinum, methotrexate, and cyclosporin. So often the reasons why children go from having a stage one to stage three disease can be because they've got an existing injury to their kidneys, either pre-renal or renal, and then they get antibiotics on top of that that cause a further injury to their kidney. And sometimes they get other agents like frusamide as well in high doses, or they get iodine for a CT scan. It's the combination of all of those things that may worsen renal failure. Um, and so it's very important if you see a child with um, a rising creatinine and um, a falling urine output, then check their drug chart to make sure there's no nephrotoxic drugs. Or if there are any drugs that you just need, you don't need to stop, but to reduce the, the dose. As I said, the, the way drugs cause or worsen renal failure, some are directly nephrotoxic to the kidneys, like aminoglycosides and vancomycin, non-steroidals. And some drugs are predominantly renally excreted. So if the glomerular filtration rate is low, the drug level will be high, and that can lead to other nephron injury, but it can also lead to other toxicity. It can also lead to other toxicity where if the if the 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 drug or the antibiotic has a uh, other forms of toxicity in the setting of a kidney injury, then the level of that that drug, if it's one hundred percent renally excreted, will increase, and so therefore the the toxic effects of that other drug will of the drug, whether it's on the CNS or whether it's on uh, uh, on other organs, uh, will will may be worse. So um, just if if it, again, as I said, if the GFR is low, that is, if your creatinine is rising, your urine output is dropping, then reconsider all the drugs a child's on. There are ways to calculate the glomerular filtration rate. And there's, I think that this is the best way, I think, or at least it's the simplest way. Um, there are very complicated formula that are probably a bit more accurate, but the, and these have been devised by a nephrologist called Schwartz. He wrote most of the definitions of calculating the GFR in children. And he's written a very, very complicated algorithm for calculating GFR, but there's a simple uh, derivative of that. And that is 0.413 times the height in centimeters divided by the serum creatinine. And that's the GFR in mils per minute per meter squared. And mostly when we think about um, creatinine, uh, glomerular filtration rate, we reference it to an adult body surface area. And so when you see the GFR um, quoted for children, people of any age, it's referenced to 1.73 meters squared, which is the average surface area of an adult. It just tells you that the glomerular filtration rate is highly dependent on, on the body surface area or a proxy for that is height. Um, I won't I won't go into it too much, but I think using GFR can be quite uh, complicated. The main thing to say is that at the time of birth, the glomerular filtration rate is quite low. If, if an adult had a GFR of 40 mils per mi minute per 1.73 meters squared, they'd be in kidney failure. But but for a, for a newborn baby, that's normal. It's 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 usually by the time, sorry, it's usually by the time a child is about two or three that they have the G GFR, the glomerular filtration rate of an adult by about two or three years of age. Don't, don't, I don't think you need to worry about that too much. It's really use the Cadigo definition for acute kidney injury, and that's probably the best way. But just remember about what to do about drugs. So if the GFR is half normal, or or in fact, if the creatinine has doubled, 
then you need to at least half the dose of the drugs that are 100% renally excreted or stop them completely if they don't if they're not needed. Certainly the nephrotoxic drugs, aminoglycosides, amphotericin, non-steroidal should be stopped. Don't give them to children who've got AKI. I wanted to touch on a couple of complications of acute renal failure, um, particularly hyperkalemia. Um, it's a relatively common complication of anuric or oliguric renal failure, and you need to be able to identify it both clinically and on an ECG. Um, so all children with an AKI should have an ECG. They should have their potassium measured. You should look on an ECG for a prolonged PR interval and particularly peak T waves. Most children who've got anuria or oliguria should be on rhizonium, um, which, is an, which is an oral agent, which is not absorbed, which just uh, adsorbs potassium in the gastrointestinal tract. It's, a, it's an ion exchange resin. If the potassium is more than six or seven millimoles per litre, that's very dangerous. And those children can be treated with a variety of different therapies. Um, some that work in seconds, some that work in minutes, some that take a bit longer to work. Uh, what works in seconds, if you've got a child who's got a very high potassium level, is calcium gluconate. So give 0.5 mils of 10% calcium gluconate over five minutes, and you'll get an effect on their potassium on their ECG, I should say, um, within seconds. Giving insulin drives potassium into cells and that, and that can lower, um, lower potassium. Again, it works generally in minutes. So you give insulin with 50% glucose and give it as a push. And again, it works in minutes to lower potassium. Calcium doesn't lower the potassium as much as as uh, insulin, but it, it works much quicker and it has a stabilizing effect on the ECG. And then give sodium bicarbonate, one millimole per kilogram, and Ventolin also leads to hypokalemia by driving potassium into, into cells. So it can be useful as well. Sometimes you need to do give all of that and then measure their potassium level again in another hour. Make sure you're not giving exogenous uh, sources of potassium. There's a variety of things you must do. And then if it's still high, then consider some form of dialysis if you can do that. This is an ECG of a child who had hyperkalemia. And as you can see, the T waves are extremely peaked. Now, the T waves should be around about six millimeters in the, in the limb leads, and they can be a little higher in the chest leads. They can be up to 10 millimetres in the chest leads. So the, these chest leads, V1 to V6, they can be as high as 10 millimetres, but you can see the T wave here, 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, 18, 18 millimetres. So way higher than what you would expect. And even in the even in the, uh, the, limb, the, the limb leads, so lead 1, 2, and uh, AVF, it's more than 6 millimetres. So this is hyperkalemia. You can see the the prolonged PR interval and the wide QRS complex. This is very serious hyperkalemia and needs that urgent therapy, calcium gluconate, insulin, and glucose, sodium bicarbonate, all of those things would be needed for that, for this ECG. Uh, the reason being, if you don't give that, if you don't lower the potassium, then cardiac standstill, the cardiac arrest can happen uh, quite suddenly. I wanted to touch on the role of ultrasound in children who've got an AKI. I think it does have a role mostly to, it, it can tell you four things, I think. One is you can make an assessment of the kidney size. And in acute uh, renal failure with, with uh, where there's some toxicity, some injury to the kidneys itself, then you'll often have large inflamed kidneys so they'll in infection or pyelonephritis or sepsis often the kidneys will be seem quite large they'll also seem more echogenic that is they'll have more more echoes they won't be the normal renal architecture but it'll be more more shadows or more echoes i'll show you some pictures so where you've got glomerulonephritis or pyelonephritis or sepsis then often the kidneys will be large and echogenic now, if the kidneys are small, then maybe that suggests that there's some more chronic renal injury going on. So the kidneys have shrunken. 
rather than being large um, in as it is in acute renal failure. You can use ultrasound to also rule out obstruction. So if a patient's got post-renal renal failure, then dilatation of the renal pelvis or the ureters or the bladder can give you an idea of where, whether there is an obstruction and also where the obstruction is. Um, if the if the ureters are normal and the just the kidneys are dilated, then it's somewhere at the pelvic seal junction. If the ureters are dilated with hydrouretters as well as hydronephrosis, then it may be at the entrance of the ureters to the bladder. Or if the bladder is very dilated, it might be at the urethral inlet as well. So you can get, get an idea where obstruction might be by where the dilation is dilatation is and, and how bad the dilatation is. Uh, uh, so I think most of us would be able to do that. Look at renal size, look at the echogenicity and rule out obstruction. Uh, it's much harder, I think, to look at the renal vascular supply and be accurate about that, but a, an ultrasonographer, a radiologist would be able to do that. These are normal kidneys and you can see the echogenicity is a little bit similar to that of the liver. This is the, the kidney adjacent to the liver Whereas this is a child who's got acute tube on the on the right hand side, the X-ray of a child with acute tubular necrosis, and you can see that this is the liver again, and the echogenicity of the kidney is much brighter. It's more echogenic or brighter than the liver, and so this is a uh, where you've got um, highly echogenic kidneys in acute tubular necrosis. It could be infection, it could be sepsis, it could be drug nephrotoxicity. It could be rhabdomyolysis. It doesn't tell you what it is. It just tells you the kidneys are inflamed and enlarged, right? And the architecture is not normal as it was before. This is where you've got hydronephrosis. And you can see this is a, the kidney. And you can see the marked dilatation of the, of the, um, uh, the, the, the kidney itself, especially at the pelvic calicele junction, a large dilatation there. And, and this is a post streptococcal glomerulonephritis again the echogenicity is remember it's brighter than the liver and this is rather similar again to um uh, to to sepsis but acute post streptococcal gn will just look like this right and so there's again a few things you can i think most of us would be able to do a renal ultrasound and check the kidneys for for those things for renal blood flow it's a little bit more specialized but some people can learn how to do that, I think, if you've got Doppler. In terms of the management of AKI, it's fairly supportive, mostly supportive care. So we need to monitor the blood pressure, the pulse, weigh the child daily. Use a clinical edema assessment. You should be assessing the child's edema. Is it just in the face? Is it in the limbs? Is it in the hands? Is it in the feet? Is it, do they have effusions? You need to re be recording edema in all body parts um, each day um, and recording their hydration state. You, can you should provide nutrition. So again, enteral nutrition is best. You should avoid so high sodium containing feeds and avoid high protein feeds because protein becomes uh, creatinine and urea and that has to be excreted. So most patients who've got um, uh, acute kidney injury should be on a relatively low protein diet for the duration of their acute kidney injury. Um, a little different if you've got nephrotic syndrome and you uh, a child's got nephrotic syndrome and they don't have renal failure. If they've just got nephrotic syndrome, that's different. They can be on a higher protein containing um, uh, diet. But if they've got um, renal impairment, that is their creatinine's high and their urine output's low, then they should be on a low protein containing feed. I wanted to just, as a last thing, talk about peritoneal dialysis, because I think for some children, it can be life-saving. And it's also not as hard to do as what people might think. Mostly, if a child's passing urine, that's the best thing much better than if they need to have dialysis. Their mortality is much lower. The management is much easier. But in, in settings where a child has severe fluid overload or severe hypertension or persistent hyperkalemia 
despite all the things I mentioned, the calcium, the bicarbonate, rhizonium, um, insulin, glucose, ventolin, et cetera, then th these children, you rather than rather than just keeping going with that that uh, treatment, can be on peritoneal dialysis to manage their hyperkalemia or their severe acidosis or their severe uremia. I haven't talked too much about uremia, but when the urea level gets to about 40 or 50, then usually there'll be an effect on the conscious state. And so children will become may have convulsions or they may um, lapse into poor conscious state. And it's important that we recognize when a patient's poor conscious state is related to uremia, when it's related to hypertension, et cetera, in, in acute kidney injury. I've just tried to draw here how to do peritoneal dialysis. And um, I'll describe it in a few ways, but it uses, as you know, a peritoneal dialysis catheter. And there are a variety of different things you can use to do that. The most common cause of uh, type of Perineal dialysis catheter is a Tinkoff catheter, which um, is a soft catheter that goes into the uh, perineal cavity, into the usually into the anterior part of the pelvis, just anterior to the bladder usually, and uh, um, and and then flu dialys dialysate fluid is instilled into the peritoneum, so that's here the dialysate usually contain somewhere between 1.5 and 5% glucose. And I'll explain why it differs, but 1.5 to 5% glucose. It's an isotonic fluid. So you should use a dialysate fluid is typically isotonic. If you don't have it, then using Hartman's solution is fine, but you have to add glucose and you have to add heparin to it. So dialysate fluid has some heparin in it to stop the to stop clots developing um, and to make sure the 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 um uh the dialysate fluid flows in uh flows in and out well. So that's the the composition of dialysate fluid. <clears throat> There's a, a Y connector here that attaches to the ultrafiltrate, a bag that drains the ultrafiltrate, and it's and it's by gravity. So gravity allows the fluid to go in and gravity enables the fluid to come out. And what, what uh, comes out is an isotonic fluid goes in. An isotonic fluid goes in, dialysate fluid with some glucose in it. And then the glucose will draw water out of the, of the, um, the peritoneal capillary membrane. So there is in the abdominal cavity, a per the peritoneum, and that has an extensive network of capillaries. And the glucose, depending on the, the concentration of glucose, it can draw more water out from the peritoneal capillaries. And it also draws out urea and creatinine and potassium, drawing them out from the because in the dialysate fluid, there's no urea and creatinine, then there's a concentration gradient and the, those, those molecules, the urea and the creatinine and the potassium will be drawn out of the, of the peritoneal capillary membrane. And then that is, um, comes out in the ultrafiltrate. Um, also, dialysate fluid has bicarbonate in it or lactate. Remember we said previously that lactate gets converted to bicarbonate in if you've got a well-functioning liver and lactate will be drawn, lactate or bicarbonate, depending on what's in the dialysate fluid, will be drawn into the capillaries and will correct the metabolic acidosis. So you can lower urea, you lower creatinine, you can lower the potassium level, you can draw off water and reduce edema, and you can correct the metabolic acidosis by perineal dialysis. You usually start with 10 to 20 mils per kilo, but, but fairly rapidly increase to about 40 mils per kilo or 50 mils per kilo over several cycles. And the cycles can be either hourly or second hourly. And hourly cycles usually run in the fluid over 10 minutes, then dwell for 30 and then out for 20. And if a two hourly cycle, it just doubles. Usually it doubles the dwell time, which is the, 
time of acrylabration, that's when the, the urea and the potassium and creatinine are being drawn out and the bicarbonate is going into the capillaries and the water is being drawn out. So perineal dialysis is a simple form of dialysis. It's not as complicated as what you think, but you obviously have to be very careful about fluid balance and you have to be very careful about um, infection control when, when a child's on dialysis. I, I have used Hartman's solution where there's no dialysate, but you have to add the glucose to it. Um, Hartman's solution sometimes comes with glucose, but often it doesn't. And you have to add a certain amount of glucose. Usually we'd start with 1.5% glucose, but you may go up to 5% glucose depending on how much water you want to take off, which I'll explain in a, in a moment. You also add heparin, as I said, 1,000 1, units per litre. So to a litre bag of Hartman's solution, add that. You're using, trying to use 40 to 50 mils per kilogram cycles. And as I said, hourly cycles in and dwell, in run in the fluid over 10 minutes, well for 30, out for 20. Two hourly cycles in, run the fluid in for 10 well for 80 and out for 30. And this is, the dwell time is what's important. So if you're not getting very good urea and creatinine clearance, then you can increase the dwell time because that will allow for a longer period of acrylabration. Now, one hourly cycles are still fine to start with, but if, if you're not lowering the, um, lowering the urea and creatinine adequately, then you either increase the volume, so up to 50 mils per kilo from... 20 or 30, whatever you started at, or you increase the dwell time. So again, if you want to remove water, then you increase the glucose concentration. So if you put 2.5% glucose in the solution instead of 1.5, you'll get more water off. If you put in 5%, you'll get more water off still. You can also increase the frequency of the cycle. So every hour or half hour, you, um, you'll get more water off. But usually we want to remove urea, we want to correct the metabolic acidosis, we want to take off urea and creatinine and potassium, then you need one to two hourly cycles, that's all. Sometimes you can use a Foley catheter as if you don't have a tink off catheter. The only issue with a Foley catheter, well, with a Foley catheter, you still have to have the Y connector, you still have to have this part that's got, that's got the um, uh, the, the, the Y connector that goes the, the, um, the, the uh, perineal dilacite fluid and the ultrafiltrate. So you still have to have that component, even though the, the Foley catheter can act, act as a Tenkoff catheter. And it's, it's a good sort of catheter because it can stay in the perineal cavity because of the balloon that's on the end of it. When you're monitoring children on perineal dialysis, it's the same as monitoring a child with AKI, except you need to look out for signs of infection because peritone, peritonitis is a genuine risk. And uh, um, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's the biggest risk when you're doing um, uh, PD. Um, also looking out for hyperglycemia because of the glucose content, the glucose gets absorbed as well as acting uh, to draw water out and being the sort of concentration gradient. So sometimes children can get hyperglycemic and they may need to be on insulin if they get hyperglycemic while they're on PD, if they're having it constantly. I wanted to just, as a last thing, briefly touch on the prognosis of children with AKI and why we would even try to recognize AKI and try to treat it as I've explained. Um, the prognosis depends very much on the cause and the stage. And so identifying not just that they've got AKI, but what the cause is and what the stage is is important. If they've got stage one, then almost certainly they'll improve as long as the inciting event, whether it's sepsis or dengue or malaria is treated. If that goes away and they've only got stage one AKI, then they'll improve. And as long as there's no secondary renal injury, as long as you've made an effort to remove those nephrotoxic drugs and as long as you maintain their blood pressure to maintain adequate renal perfusion. Remember, in a child with AKI, you don't want their blood pressure to be low because it will cause more a secondary renal damage. If they've got stage two or stage three, then they may have acute tubular necrosis that lasts 
with oliguria that lasts for up to six weeks. Uh, sometimes it recovers within two or three weeks and sometimes it takes six weeks, but generally it will resolve. And that's what's important is that mostly if the inciting event is, is, has evolved, resolved, if there's no secondary injury and if you can maintain the blood pressure, then usually their ATN or their acute tubular necrosis that might last for up to six weeks will resolve. If a child's got um, multi-organ failure or DIC, then their prognosis is much uh, more, more uncertain. But there are some children that have quite a good outcome with AKI, even in, in stage two or sometimes with stage three disease. So if they've got post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis and they don't have other organ failure, if they're non-oliguric, that is, if they're still making some urine, if they're not needing dialysis, if their other organs are functioning well, and if there's no other secondary injury to the kidneys from drugs or hypovolemia or hypotension during that period of time, then they, they will do well. Their kidney failure grade stage one or two will resolve. And so it's worth, um, I think, understanding about acute kidney injury, the different stages, the different causes, how to diagnose it and how to manage it, um, because many of these children do, uh, do very well. That's all I wanted to say today about AKI in children. I hope that's been useful for you and uh, we'll um, I'll stop I'll stop my slides now.